All right. Well, good morning and happy Sunday to everyone. Now, as I say that, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and tell your face that you're happy this morning, all right? Some of y'all hadn't worked on that yet. You haven't smiled at anybody. So good morning and happy Sunday. I got to say, this morning has already been fire, has it not? I I love our time together. Think about this. When you came in this morning and you saw people in the parking lot and they were smiling at you. And as you came to a door or to a community group, people were smiling. They were glad to see you. They looked you in the eyes and they said, we are so glad that you're here. Think about this. Some of y'all have community. There are friends and family that you don't get to see during the week. And then when you come in here, there are people ready to give you a fist bump, a high five, a hug, and say, man, this is our time together. Then we just had a time where literally we were able to worship together. Whether we know the words of the song, maybe we do know them, the, the overflow of our heart is coming across our lips, and we are getting to praise God for who he is and what he's done. And then when we pray together, y'all, I got to tell you, we look at this and knowing that God wants to hear us. And when we bring our hearts before him, we say, God, would you move in this way? And he is a God who hears. And I'm telling you, I am fired up for this time together because we haven't even got to the word yet. And I love when we get to spend time in the word together. I hope that each and every week, every Sunday, you are craving this time. That you look forward to a time where you get to hear and study and listen to the Word of God. I hope that these times are jet fuel for your soul. That you are filled up, fired up, and ready to go into the week that God has called you to from our time together. And even this morning, starting last night, as I was praying and as a group of men were gathered around a table this morning, we were praying before you ever got here that this would not just be another Sunday. Because here's what I know. We're pretty good at church. We can put some good music on stage. We can put some good elements in here. We can capture some moments through video. We can preach a pretty good sounding sermon. And we can do it all on our own and miss the Lord. But we want to come and say, God, would you move in this place? Would you speak in this place? Would you let your presence be felt in this place? And we come saying, God, would you move here? And my heart has been, as we prayed this morning as men over the church, that that the Lord would draw you near, that God would bring you in and speak clearly to you. Because this is what I know. Without a shadow of a doubt, God has a word for you this morning. Can I just go ahead and talk to you real honestly? You're not here by accident. You're not here by accident. You didn't just show up or maybe this was something that was supposed to happen. You are here on purpose. And I want to let you know, you're not invisible. No matter how alone, no matter how lonely, no matter how insignificant you feel, the Lord sees and knows you. He created you on purpose. You are no accident. And a God who created you, who knows you, who who knows everything about you, this God is. He loves you. Amen? Amen. And He cares about you. This is not an insignificant time. And and I believe He wants to speak to you. And this isn't a question I've asked you many times before. If the God of the universe, Yahweh, the one seated on the throne, the creator of heaven, if He wanted to speak a word to you, wouldn't you want to hear it? And I mean, I think it would be a resounding yes, would it not? Like if God wanted to speak, I would want to know what he had to say to me. And every time we go to God's word, he speaks to us. And that's exactly what I'm expecting here today. To go to the word, to hear it read and taught, and for him to speak clearly. Clearly here in Claremont, clearly over at Dahlonega and our friends at Mount Yona, all three campuses hearing the truth of Scripture this morning. But I stand here on the end of spring as we're looking towards summer. Many of you college students, you guys have got finals this week and you're about to tie a bow on this year. And you're getting ready for summer. Some of our uh, students and teachers and administrators, you are counting down the days until school does not meet anymore and summer officially starts. Can I get an amen from the teachers? That was way too much amen and all right. But when I look back at this spring, it has been an incredible time of what God's doing. Every week I look in here and I see brand new faces. 
So if you're new around here, you've just been coming a little bit, we are so glad that you're here. We're also seeing folks join the church each uh, time we have our starting point. We're seeing families saying, I want to come be a part of the foundation. I want to be in. I want to affect change in our community. We're seeing people give their lives to Jesus in, in service and at different events. It was so funny the other night. We had a dodgeball tournament for our students, which literally is this. Come hear about Jesus and then let's throw things at each other. I love it. Such a simple strategy. And we have almost 200 gathered on our campus and, and students saying, raising my hand, I want to live for Jesus. It was incredible. We're seeing people be baptized. It seems almost every week that, that men are standing up and saying, I want the world to know that I'm Jesus. Entire family saying, as far as me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It is powerful what God is doing. We're seeing mission trips, training during the spring, getting ready to go share the gospel on your behalf and in agreement with the Great Commission in areas all over our country and world. Families dedicating their children, as you saw by video, saying, we will raise our kids not to achieve in this world, but to follow the Lord Jesus in our church saying, we're with you. College students graduating, being shot out as arrows into this world for the name of Christ. And so as we stand here, I just want to ask you, aren't you so glad that God is moving in all of our campuses. Aren't you glad that God is not done moving in your life, in your family's life, that He's not done in this church's life? Praise God that He is faithful and intentional to continue to move, that the best days are not just behind us, but they may very well be ahead of us. Amen? So with that said, we are going to jump in to Scripture today and continue our series in 1 John. Now, as you know, we plan and pray and prepare a year in advance for everything that we're going to teach. Each August, we go away and we've prepared and we sit down with January through December and we plan week by week what we believe the Lord is, is, is leading us to teach in Scripture. And as we started this, we looked last August and said, First John, we're going to teach that right before summer. And there's five chapters, five weeks, we're going to do it. And as I got to it, I said, there is no way in the world we can cover this in five weeks. So we kind of spread it out over two months. And I know this to be true because I only got through four verses last week. And you guys were troopers and you hung with me in it. But today, we are going to cover the next eight verses about walking in the light. It was funny, a couple of uh, weeks ago, I had one of our uh, church members come up to me and they said, Pastor Clint, you got to slow down. I can't keep up with all of the notes and you didn't give a sermon title. And this lady was so distraught the entire sermon because she didn't have a sermon title. So let me give it to you today, all you type A's, all right? It's walking in the light. Very simply, that's what we're going to do. So I want to invite you uh, to take your Bible and turn to the book of 1 John. If you're new to Scripture, go ahead and flip to the very back of your Bible to the book of Revelation and go left a little bit. You'll hit Jude and 3rd and 2nd John, then 1 John. Now, there's four notes that I want to encourage you to take today as we look at these eight verses together. I want to encourage you to take notes, to write down in your Bible, or take your uh, notes app on your phone, or if you've grabbed one of these journals, these things are awesome. It's literally a tool that has Scripture on one side and notes on the other. You know why I like this tool right here? Because it is something that we can put you in your hand that you can use. It's something, students, when you're asked to lead a, a Devo or a Bible study or an FCA or a, a, a lunchroom, a little prayer time, you have Scripture and notes that you can go to to start with. I heard of a businessman this week that he started leading Bible studies, made it available to all of his staff members to come. He would provide breakfast and they would study God's Word together. You have a tool where you can go back through and study this. But before we get to our notes, I want to... I want to read these eight verses that we're going to study today as a whole. I want you to see the thread that John is writing here. And so would you uh, read with me? It says this, This is the message that we have heard from him and proclaim to you. That God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie. And do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. 
And the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we've not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Y'all. And let me go ahead and go back to my deep southern drawl. Y'all. It's about to get really real in here, all right? I mean really real. Like my hope is that you all wore steel-toed boots today because this truth is going to stomp all over it. Y'all going to leave with some bruised toes and some missing toenails after this today. So, Yona, you still good? You with me, Claremont? You good, Delonica? Here we go. Here's the first note that I want you to write down. This is the message. God is Light, And I know some of y'all are like, Pastor, you are so creative. Like, that is strong. You literally took that out of the first verse. You're right. This is the message. God is light. Simple and true. God is light. But this is important because everything moving forward in these eight verses that's going to cause us to evaluate our faith has to be built on this truth. He's finished his prologue, his introduction, and this is where John gets after it in this letter. He says, this is the message. And so God is light. His very nature, uh, he himself is light. Watch this. 1 John chapter 1 verse 5. This is the message that we've heard from him, and now we proclaim to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. I mean, he starts out with this contrast. There is light and there is dark, and they are opposite of each other. He says, God is light, and in him there's what? Come on, come on. It says, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. This pastor that I really respect, he's a great author, been a pastor for 40, 50 years. His name is Tony Evans. And he wrote this when looking at this verse. He says, this message isn't a spiritual platitude, but it's a truth that has significant spiritual implications for your life. That this isn't just something that we say, but if it's true, it changes everything about the way we operate spiritually. See, this light is representative of God's holiness. God's purity, His very nature. And in Scripture, we know that darkness represents sin and evil. And what it's saying is God is absolutely light and there is no darkness in Him. God has no sin. Not one bit, not one shadow, not one association. God is light. Amen? Amen. And there is no darkness. Now, this is important because of who Jesus is. That Jesus is God in flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, that he was completely sinless. That he was tempted in every way that you and I are, yet without sin. So this is a game changer. There is no darkness at all. God is pure and perfect, holy and right. And there's no darkness at all. John chapter 1. This got confusing last week. I kept going. 1 John 1, John 1, 1 John 1. But John 1, 4 and 5 says this. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. You know what I love about light? It doesn't have an equal relationship with darkness. See, it's not like you can have a candle or a light and you just add more darkness and it presses the candle in. You can't just keep adding darkness and it'll put out the light eventually. See, light always stays steady. But the more light you add, the further it pushes back the darkness. The darkness has no power over the light. Light pushes it back. It is not 
overcoming. Here's the second note I want you to write down, and it's a call to action and evaluation. That you and I, we need to ditch the darkness and walk in the light. You and I need to ditch the darkness and walk in the light. I got a question for you. Have you ever known a person, not you, somebody else, that says one thing, and then there's a gap between what they say and how they live? Now, once again, not you, not at all, right? Y'all are great, but somebody else probably. That they say one thing, then there's a gap between what they say they believe and how they actually live. Anybody know anybody like that? Because it's not you. It's definitely somebody else, right? (laughs) That there's a gap. You know, people who say one thing and live consistently a different way, those are the people that cause a lot of confusion, right? And in turn, many times, cause a lot of hurt. Because they will say, I love Jesus with my whole life. With everything that I am, I am devoted to Christ. And then consistently, over and over, they live a life that doesn't align with that. Constantly, day after day, week after week, living in a way that's opposite of that. And John is going to take this brutal reality and begin to deal with it. Remember, today is about calling us to action and evaluation. 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 says this. If we say, if we say we have fellowship with Him, while we walk in darkness, we lie. And we do not practice the truth. Now, let me give you a little clue as we're studying these verses. John's going to give us three, if we say, scenarios. If we say this, then this. And those are going to be in verse 6. They're going to be in verse 8 and in verse 10. So if you write in your Bible, go ahead and underline verse verse 6, verse 8, verse 10. That says, if we say. Because these tests, if we say, are going to give you and I a chance to validate... Or expose a lack of relationship with Christ. Now this is going to be tough. But it's going to be necessary. Yona, listen to me. This is a necessary test for you to have. See, John says, if we say we have fellowship with God, I am walking with the Lord. Yet we walk in darkness. What does it say? That we lie. And we're not practicing the truth. See, if God is light... And we say we're in fellowship but walk in darkness. He says, you're not telling the truth. You know, there's a sneaky thing that has slipped into the American church that we have not only accepted but we've kind of embraced. And it's a version of antinomianism. If you're not familiar with that word, it's, it's a belief that goes something like this. I can make a decision, walk an aisle, fill out a card, get my fire insurance for hell... And then live however I want. Now most of us would never say that's how we live. But for some of us it's exactly how we live. Let me give you a scenario. You are walking with the Lord or you say you're walking with the Lord. And you come up on a sin and and you have this mindset. You're going, I know I shouldn't do this. But I'm saved. And I know God will forgive me. And we do it anyway. We say, just one more drink. Just just one more time with that person. Just one more look. Just one more this, that, or the other. And we begin to abuse the powerful and life-changing grace of God. And he says, if you have fellowship, you say you have fellowship with God, but you are consistently walking in the darkness. That ain't true. And your walk will either validate or invalidate your relationship with the Lord. That's a very sobering truth. But why is darkness a struggle? Look in John chapter 3 verse 19. It says this. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world... And people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. 
For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. See, light has a way of exposing what's in the hidden corners, in the closets of our life. The things that we've compartmentalized and put away that nobody else can see. And, and, and we like to keep those things in the dark and put on the mask that we got everything together. Because light exposes. And so people, apart from Christ, they love the darkness so their sin can be hidden. But look at 1 John 1, 7. Continuing the passage, it says this. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. Take heart, child of God. If you have a relationship with the Lord, you have been made brand new with him. Your sins are forgiven. You have been justified by the death and resurrection and the power that is in Christ. And we are called to walk in the light, continually being sanctified, growing and maturing. The light is where we want to be, nothing hidden. Now I got a question for you. How many of you guys are scared of the dark? Anybody? Any bold enough to raise your hand? Okay, a couple of you. The rest of y'all liars, all right? Let's go back a little bit. How many of y'all at one point in your life have ever been scared of the dark? All right. So a lot of you got to go back to childhood, right? You go back and, and, and you think of it like this. You're in a grade school and, and you finish dinner and you've done your chores and, and you get ready for bed and, and you get in there. Mom comes in and reads you a story and she's reading these lines. But as the book pages begin to turn towards the end, you know what's coming. That mom is going to close that book and say the end. And then she's going to start walking towards the door. And what does she do when she gets to the door? She flips the lights out. Boom. And all of a sudden, it gets dark. And all of a sudden, this darkness has a weight. And it begins to feel heavy. And, and all of a sudden, fear begins to creep in as your bedroom gets darker and darker and darker. And you can no longer see what's hidden in the corner. And you begin to hear things that you didn't hear before. And all of a sudden you begin to worry about what's under the bed or in the closet or around the corner. And so you get up and you turn on your nightlight. And then it begins to get a little lighter and lighter and lighter. And all of a sudden you can see a little bit. Because the light begins to push back the darkness and expose the corners of the room. And so with that, this, this fear is then pushed back by the light. The evil, the, the, the scary things come. But God is light, and when we pursue walking in the light, we walk in Him. Let's turn the lights back on. Some of y'all were getting nervous. Y'all like, I don't know who came in behind me. It's a guilty conscience, all right? But it leads us to our third note. That you and I have not arrived. We need to keep humble and keep current. That you and I have not arrived. We need to keep humble and keep current. Can I give you a little secret that I've learned over the last 20 years of following Christ? I, I came to Christ in college. I was in church my entire life, but put a, put a reality to my relationship in college. And this is what I've learned. Walking with Christ takes work. It takes daily Giving your life as a living sacrifice to the Lord. Constantly saying, God, your way, not my way. God, I trust you with everything. We have to understand that we haven't arrived. That one day we will achieve something where we will never be tempted. We will never struggle. But walking with Christ is an everyday thing, a constant pursuit. And I must keep humble before the Lord. And then communicate with the Lord. Keeping Constant communication because this is where we come to our second if we say scenario. In verse 8 it says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Can I tell you something? All of us have sinned. Every one of us. That's what scripture says. There's none of us that have not sinned. By our very nature we're bent away from God. And since many of you have been saved, you've sinned again, have you not? You may think you're 
you're deceiving everybody, but you're not fooling anybody. You're not, you're only deceiving yourself as a follower of Christ. I've got to tell you though, we cannot live in habitual and continual sin and ignore the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Those things are just not congruent. And I know that's a tough thing to say, but 1 John 3 in one of these circular thoughts says this, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has ever seen him or knows him. This is an an earth-shattering truth, but it is one worth repeating. We cannot live in persisting sin. Go back to chapter 1, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, though, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I want you to remember who this book is written to because as I've studied this over the years, there's kind of two schools of thoughts and I've been in both camps, but this is written to believers. He talks about my little children. I'm writing this so that, and you need to know he's communicating. And he says, if we confess our sins, confess in the Greek means to agree with. To say the same thing. You're saying, God, this is your standard. This is where I fell short. God, I agree. I agree with you that this is where I've fallen short. And we as believers get to come before the Lord and say, God, this is where I've fallen short. God, I agree with you. You're keeping communication with the Lord. We're not just stacking this up and going, oh, the Lord doesn't care with that. I'm saved. It's all good. But we're communicating with the Lord. And when we do fall, look at this. We have a God who is faithful and is just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is through the atonement of Jesus Christ, his son. I love this verse in Numbers chapter 14. It's repeated in different ways in different parts of scripture. If you don't memorize scripture, this would be a great one to do. We memorize all kinds of things all the time. Psalm lyrics, passcodes, email passwords. We we memorize. Memorize scripture. It says this. The Lord is slow to anger. How many of y'all are glad that God's patient? It says he's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Forgiving iniquity and transgression. Aren't you glad we have a God like that? who is slow to anger, abounding in love, who forgives. But I got to tell you, sin is a serious thing because there's the other side of this verse and says, but by, but he will by no means clear the guilty. It's not like God just doesn't care about it, sweeps it under a rug, being like, oh, you're all good. Don't worry about it. Do better next time, champ. But he visits the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations is what Numbers says. We have a God who is holy and perfect, who is light, and there is no darkness at all. And then there's us, whose very nature apart from Christ is to sin and go our own way. Even when we've been made new in Him, we have times where we sin. But as we grow in this relationship, as we come to Him, we have to understand that we have to drag things into the light. I think about it like this. I used to love to go to movies as a kid, right? It was so fun. As a teenager, your parents would drop you off at the movie theater and you would buy your Coke and popcorn and your candy. That was all great. Now, it's different. I go to the movies and I just pay for a $15 nap in a big chair, all right? (laughs) But back when you were a kid, it was a lot of fun. And you would go and all your friends are there and you'd be sitting there and you're talking and laughing and doing your whole thing. And then then all of a sudden they would darken the lights a little bit and they would roll the previews and this movie coming and this movie coming and this. And then all of a sudden they turn the lights all the way down and turn the music all the way up, right? And you just hear the speakers rumbling and then your movie starts and you're watching this movie and man, it is an awesome time together. And then as you finish the movie, somebody goes through the exit at the bottom that goes directly outside, right? And that sunlight comes in and just stabs you in the face. And you're like, oh my goodness, and everybody's trying to make their way down because you're coming out of the darkness towards the light and you open that door and it's so bright and you're seeing spots. 
Hey, sometimes that's how we feel when we bring ourselves before the Lord. We're coming out of the darkness into the light. And it's a difficult process. But we're saying, God, I agree this stuff does not need to be in my life. I'm no longer hiding it. God, I'm bringing it before you. Because 1 John 1.10 says, if we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. See, God's word says that we've all sinned. And when we say we've not, we're making God a liar. Not only are we lying, we're making God out to be a liar. But I love that in the desperateness and the heaviness of this, as you examine your life, you're like, well, Pastor, well, what in the world do I do? I struggle all the time. Oh, wait for chapter 2, verse 1. Look at this. This is our, our, our fourth note. Jesus is our advocate and the hope of the world. Jesus. For the Christian, Jesus is your advocate. For the non-Christian, He is your hope of eternal life. This is such a sweet but powerful sentence. And in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, He says this, My little children... It's almost like John is grabbing his kids by the arms. You know, when you you bring your little one, you grab them by the arms and you bring them just face to face and you're like, I got to tell you something. He says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ, the righteous. See, John's goal in writing this letter is that the children of God wouldn't sin. I know some of us think we'll never be sinless, but this is literally written so that we will sin less. He says, I'm writing that you may not sin, but if you do, which all of us need this, right? You have an advocate in Jesus Christ, the righteous. I love this word advocate because in the Greek, it's the Greek word parakletos, the paraclete, the one who comes alongside. It's the picture of a courtroom, of a defense attorney. You are being charged and accused and, and, and your advocate is, is advocating on your behalf, but not on your merits and your right standing, but from their position and their right standing. Look at how Jesus is described in the rest of Scripture. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven. Jesus is our high priest in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He's not only our high priest, he's our mediator. But he's also our sacrificial substitute. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, our last verse. He is the propitiation or atoning sacrifice, the one that, that takes the full wrath of God for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Child of God, listen to me. Jesus is your high priest. He is your mediator. He is your substitutionary atonement and your advocate before God for when we do get it wrong. Jesus Christ the righteous. And it says He died not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. Hey, listen, can I clear up something for you? Just because Jesus died does not mean everybody is saved and going to heaven. He died for the sins of the whole world. But we need to turn from our sins and put our faith in Him being drawn by the Spirit of God to Him. He's our advocate, but for the lost, He is their hope. And it's only in Jesus. No amount of church attendance, no amount of good works, no matter of better than last year. It is in Jesus in His perfect life, His death on the cross, His burial and resurrection from the grave that we have hope. I want to reiterate Romans chapter 3 to you today. It says, for all have sinned. How many of us? How many? Are you excused from that? Am I? No. 
all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But look how the redemption story is written. And are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. What a good God we serve. So today, church, with maybe some bruised toes, maybe some convicted hearts, my heart is that you would respond to the Word of God today. So we're going to end service a little differently today. I'm going to ask everyone to respond. And you're like, all right, hold on. What's about to happen? Hey, listen, I'm just going to ask you to respond to what you've heard today in one of four ways. First one is this. If you don't know Jesus and you need him today, when you look at your life and you go, man, my lifestyle, my walk either validates or invalidates my relationship with Christ. And you say, man, I, I just don't know that I'm saved. I need Jesus. I want you to respond in that way. For some of you, maybe it's to deal with some sin in your life. And you, like coming out of that movie theater, need to take this addiction, this struggle, this pet sin that we love, that we abuse the grace of God on, and we need to drag it into the light and say, God, I agree. Help me. And you need to get humble before God and go, this thing's going to kill me. I need to deal with my sin. I don't want to make God out to be a liar to say, and I, I walk with him and I live week after week. My reputation is a gossip. My reputation is a slanderer. My reputation is filled with lust and lies and envy and greed and hate. Unforgiveness and bitterness. And we just let these things cling on to our lives. Maybe you need to deal with some of that today. Or maybe thirdly, There's been sin that has destroyed a relationship that you have. And you need to pray that that relationship will be restored and reconciled today. Or maybe you say, Pastor Clint, I'm good. I know Jesus. I'm current in my walk with Him. My relationships are good. There's no... There's nothing in me that needs to be dealt with today. I am so glad you're here. Can you mentor me? But maybe today you want to come on behalf of someone who needs salvation. Maybe a spouse or a kid or a co-worker or a neighbor or a teammate. Somebody in one of your study groups. And you say, God, would you save them? Or maybe you know somebody who's struggling with a sin. They just can't get out from under it. You want to pray on their behalf. This is how we're going to end service today. We're going to respond. So how we're going to do that in in just a moment, we're going to have people in all four corners, just different staff and volunteers that will make themselves available. Y'all go ahead and go to your corners. And if you just need to pray with somebody, say, man, would you pray with me? Would you help me with something? I just need somebody else in this. They're going to be there for you. But we're also going to open up the front of the stage. If you just need to come and put yourself in a posture of humility before God, dealing with sin, uh, dealing with a relationship, praying on behalf of someone, saying, God, I just put myself in submission to you. It's a beautiful picture. But I want to ask us to respond in one of those four ways. So this is how we're going to do it. I'm going to pray. When I say amen, I'm going to ask that you come, that you respond in some way to the word of God you've heard today. I beg you, don't just cross your arms and say, this isn't for me. Pray. Respond. And then we'll sing a final song together. Y'all good with that? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the chance to come on Sundays to run into smiling faces, to enjoy community, to sing and express our gratitude to you, to sit under the counsel of your word. And God, I know today is a convicting passage, a hard one to preach, that says, if we truly walk with you, we will walk in the light and not in the darkness. God, I believe there may be some here today that need a relationship with you. They've done all the right things. They've prayed all the right prayers. But Lord, they just need you. 
I pray that today you would give them courage. That heart beating faster right now, that sweat, that that fear that someone might see. God, I pray that you would put that away and let them talk to somebody. God, for those who have sin in their life right now, that they just need to drag into the light and say, God, I've given this to you. I tried on my own and I can't. I need your help. God, would sin and chains and bondage fall here today? God, for those who've had relationships destroyed, God, I pray that you would begin to restore that, that forgiveness would be given, bitterness and grudges would be laid down. God, they would have fellowship one with another under the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for those who are feeling a burden for someone they know to come to you, God, that they would get on their knees before you, God, and say, would you save them? God, may we not be held by pride or anything, but take a posture of humility before you today and respond in the name of Jesus.